after exposure to the blood of a symptomatic colleague, I found myself making my way up the stairs to this room. And I am not alone. Everyone who's infected, we've all come up here wanting to get outside. I know full well I mustn't leave, given the possibility I'm infected. Yet, I can't contain this urge I feel inside me, like the alcoholic who tries to make any excuse for one more drink. Every step I took up those stairs filled me with this sense of bliss. I still have all my wits about me. It took no time at all to rewire the electronic lock and open the emergency exit. Then, just as I was about to set foot outside, I finally realized what was going on. This desire for freedom is not my own, but that of the vocal cord parasites inside me. They want the ravens to feed on us, pecking us to death, attracted by these sweet secretions. They have mutated to facilitate this. The sweet smell is powerful enough to attract even a species with such a weak nose. So, before the parasites take complete control, I must. Most of the staff in here are already infected. At least, everyone I've looked at is. Infection with this parasite causes a high fever in the pharynx. I have modified a pair of night vision goggles to react only to this temperature range. With these goggles, you can identify who is infected. Other infected will, like me, feel compelled to make it outside. If the ravens get their meal, they'll head for land next. That cannot be allowed to happen. The whole idea of the vocal cord parasites was that they'd only copulate once exposed to a specific language over time. But the parasites infecting our men in the laboratory laid their eggs straight away. The larvae were eating their lung tissue almost immediately. What kind of mutation was it? Those who were infected and cured still carried the vocal cord parasites in their throats. They were still there but the males had been rendered female by the Volbachia, and copulation could not occur, so we thought. But it is the Volbachia that mutated, not the parasites. You remember I told you the Volbachia attempts to maximize its number of female infected hosts? Yes, hence the male-to-female transformation. Precisely. But other Volbachia strains use different methods cytoplasmic incompatibility, killing the males, and parthenogenesis. Parthenogenesis? Aphids? Aphids use that to reproduce via females only. Very good. The females lay their eggs without a male present, creating clones of themselves in explosive numbers. Parthenogenesis was originally a means for an organism to take maximum advantage of abundant resources by increasing its numbers. Certain strains of Obakia forced this to occur, to create more and more infected females. And that's why our men develop symptoms in the blink of an eye. Obakia causing parthenogenesis is common in parasitic wasps. Of course, the Volbachia I introduced to your men did not have this characteristic, but I believe the mutation, whatever it was, caused it to force parthenogenesis in its host, the vocal cord parasites. 
The Wolbachia we used to prevent egg lane became the agent of limitless reproduction. There's something else. The symptomatic infected in the laboratory all wanted to get outside, even knowing there was napalm waiting for them out there. You said the parasites made them act that way, but parasites controlling humans. Is it possible? Parasites altering the host's behavior is a common occurrence in the world of nature. Long ago, the vocal cord parasites had this ability. But even I never foresaw they might control humans. Until I heard the things your man said. You mean the researcher on the top floor? The bit about, I'm not a snail? Yes. Among parasitic worms, there is a genus called Leucochloridium that uses snails as intermediary hosts. As you know, snails prefer dark, gloomy environments. But once parasitized by Leucochloridium, they desire to be in the light. And that is not all. The parasitic worms thrust themselves into the snail's antennae, making them swell to abnormal size. The snail, meanwhile, frantically wiggles its antennae as the parasites squirm inside. The swollen, wriggling antennae soon resemble caterpillars. I don't get it. It is so they can be eaten by birds. Leucochloridium needs a bird as its definitive host to breed. They require their snail host to be snapped up by a predator. So they make the humble snail appear to be a delicious caterpillar and lead it to somewhere in open sight. So you mean the staff trying to get outside? Was so the birds could peck at them. The parasites altered their mental state, making them crave higher places and to be outdoors. I can only surmise that both the Volbachia and the parasites mutated before the ancestors of the vocal cord parasites infected humans. Their hosts were birds. What we saw in the laboratory was some throwback to that time. The parasites attempting to make birds their intermediary hosts. It sounds insane. A prey mantis that is host to a parasitic hair worm will dive into water and drown itself. Just so the hair worm can lay its eggs in water. Rats infected with Toxoplasma gondii lose their instinctive caution and run right up to cats. Just some of the many ways parasites control the host. But we're humans. Surely our minds are too complex for that. I thought just the same. Free will is what makes us human. So it never occurred to me that the parasites could be controlling the symptomatic. But the mood. The will of a person can be easily affected by the balance of their cerebral substances. Take the toxoplasma I mentioned. It does infect humans, and it is thought the infected develop a more reckless attitude. Mm. But to think that mutations occurred in both the Walbachia and its parasite hosts... Your observation is most apt. Both mutations occurring at once indicates the presence of a powerful mutagen. I see. Keep working on narrowing down what it was. Mm. It appears I was looking at things wrong. What do you mean? All of you. Until now, I had thought of your organization, Diamond Dogs, as a superorganism. Uh, you'll have to explain that one. The term refers to a unit of eusocial insects like ants or bees. While made up of many individuals, they behave as though they are one organism, with the queen as their nerve center. The closed ties you share here reminded me of that. Well, the boss's efforts do pull us all together. I was not finished. I'm speaking in terms of homogeneity. You come from all walks of life, do you not? 
Many races and tongues, talents and pasts, complementing each other, influencing each other, making Diamond Dogs the unique group that it is. Of course. We have no use for mindless drones around here. Is that so? Then perhaps an organization like yours is a truer superorganism than the ants and bees. Meaning? Most organisms adapt to their environment by coexisting with other species. Take the cow, for instance. Its rumen, the first stomach, contains an incredible number of bacteria which digest the food it has consumed. Without their help, the cow could not break down the fiber in grasses. The cow has to outsource its means of survival to them. You don't say. Man is the same. Some 100 trillion bacteria live inside the human intestines. Without the bacteria, they could not function properly. And it does not stop there. The stomach, the mouth, the skin. Even the placenta contains bacteria that coexist with us. The same is true of parasites. In fact, the human immune system has evolved based on parasites being a part of it. Without them, the immune system can run amok and even damage other parts of the body. This is all very interesting, but what does it have to do with diamond dogs? A harmonious superorganism is made up not of a group of homogeneous individuals, but of diverse individuals that complement each other. That is what I saw in your group here. Then it occurred to me that man is a superorganism. Man's phenotype is not determined solely by his genetics. Some say if you mapped the genomes of all bacteria in the human body, the result would be over 100 times bigger than the human genome. The sum of man's genome and those of the organisms he coexists with, call it a metagenome, creates the superorganism we know as a human being. Oh, now that's quite a leap. You think so? Then try a broader perspective. If our world were a human body, you would be parasites. You make a living by doing the dirty work that the world powers cannot handle themselves. From their perspective, you are likely a nuisance. But without you, pus would build up around the world and autotoxemia, self-poisoning, would follow. The world needs your kind. Thank goodness for that. Skullface forced me to turn parasites into weapons. Creatures with which we are supposed to coexist. Meanwhile, that foundation I worked with focused solely on the human genome. Apparently thinking that manipulating it would get them whatever new form they want. Both ways are mistakes. Neither is a true superorganism. I am Dine. By speaking with those living inside me, we enhance one another and enjoy harmonious growth. Such was the original purpose of my research. You have made me remember this. <laughs> Well, it's an honor. You can travel the world, but you won't find another place like this. If the whole world was like this base, I think the peoples of the world would bid farewell to fighting for good. Maybe that's what the boss wanted in the end. <laughs>